I love truffles because of the because of that aroma profile. The the thing that I look forward to every year is opening the fridge door uh, when I've got some truffle in, in 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 the fridge because the the aroma just wafts out of the out of the, out of the fridge, um, and uh, that's an aroma that I just I kill for. This is The Producers. I'm Danny Vallant. Nigel Wood grows truffles at Truffle Paddock, a small farm outside Melbourne where 600 trees coax tuber melanosporum into existence. He also sources truffles to make products, including truffle honey and truffle salt, and is the founder of the Truffle Melbourne Festival. When Nigel bought his farm, he thought he might grow grapes for wine, but the aroma, flavour and romance of truffles hooked him in and he became a pioneer in an Australian industry that's grown exponentially in the past 20 years. Uh, so my name's Nigel Wood and uh, my truffle farm is called uh, Truffle Paddock. Hello. Uh, uh, the farm is about an hour and a half out of Melbourne uh, towards Phillip Island, um, just out of a little town called Grantville. It's rolling hillside. Um, a lot of it was cleared uh, 100, 120 years ago. So it's the sort of bald hills of, uh, of uh, southwest Gippsland. Uh, that, uh, that forest was basically shipped out of Grantville and uh, came up to Melbourne uh, and became uh, foundation timber for a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the buildings that were built um, in the late eight, 1800s uh, in Melbourne. So it's cleared land. Uh, it's, it's quite close to the coast. We're about uh, two hills on from the on the uh, in from the coast, so um, we our, our climate is a little bit moderated by being so close to the sea. So we don't get quite as cold as I'd, I'd like ideally sometimes on those cooler evenings, just because of that climate moderation. But we've still had lots of um, uh, eight degrees, six degrees uh, evenings, and that's what we really need for ripening the truffle and. Uh, uh, we first hunted um, a, a couple of weeks ago, 20, uh, on the 28th of May. We found half a kilo of truffles and in that first hunt, and, and uh, they were, um, as they often are with early season truffle, they were unevenly ripe. So, um, as you, uh, and with a little bit of rot. But as you move more into the sea, into the peak time of the season, which is where we're getting to now, then you're getting full ripeness and, and uh, the full aroma notes. The land came first. The idea of creating a truffier emerged next. How did Nigel Wood decide to be a truffle farmer? Well, uh, it's a long story. I guess um, I, when I first got the farm 25 years ago, I was thinking that I was going to grow uh, some grapes. I was pretty keen to grow grapes, but my brother-in-law, who was um, is a um, a uh, very experienced uh, winemaker said to me, look, there are a lot of work and within, if you want to make wine, within uh, 10 kilometres of where, you, of where your farm is, there are 10 different grape producers. So um, think about doing something else. And, you know, I'm a bit of a, I'm a, I'm a self-taught cook. I'm not, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a, by, by no means a trained chef. But I've I've always appreciated uh, the, the the aroma profile of, of truffles and what they can do with just about lift, with lifting just about any dish. So uh, did some soil tests. Uh, we knew already what the temperature range at the, at the at the farm was, but we basically did some soil tests to see whether um, uh, we could in fact uh, get the, uh, bring the bring the paddock up to uh, the conditions that uh, were needed. And that soil test confirmed that yes, uh, that would be possible. And so that was basically how I how I how I first started, uh, Danny. We we planted 400 trees in the the first year, and then a couple of years later, about three years later, we planted another couple of hundred trees. So we've got 600 trees now. Few foods evoke the mystery, prestige, romance, and narrative of truffles. But what actually is this fascinating underground mushroom? and which conditions encourage it to take hold and form its marvellously odiferous fruit. Truffles are basically an underground mushroom. Uh, they, uh, the reason they've got such a powerful scent is because unlike above ground mushrooms, which can spread their spore 
when the wind blows uh, the spore along. Uh, the, the, the truffles had to uh, develop a different way of being able to reproduce. And the way they uh, ultimately have done that is to produce this powerful aroma. Now, in, in uh, southern, uh, southern Europe, so in uh, the, uh, the south of Spain, uh, sorry, the, uh, the south of France and uh, central high areas in, um, uh, in Spain and northern Italy, there's a bit of an arc through there of... Um, uh, where the uh, this particular truffle that we're speaking about, the French black truffle or the Perigord truffle, the botanical name is uh, Tuba uh, melanosporum. Those uh, those grow on quite uh, 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 calcareous soil. So here in Australia, uh, so that means a pH for people who remember their chemistry. That means a pH of seven point five or or eight. It's an alkaline um, uh, territory. Because we've got very old soils in Australia, they uh, they have a very low, a much lower pH, around um, 5.5. So, in order to uh, produce truffles in Australia, unless you are in an area like in the limestone coast where there already is pl- plenty of lime in the soil, then you really need to add a, a great deal of lime um, uh, to bring the pH up to from 5.5 up to that 7.5 or or 8 pH. And so when we uh, planted our farm, or before we actually planted the trees, what we needed to do was to add, just in a small paddock, which is about 1.2 hectares, we added about 140 tonnes of lime, uh, Danny. So it it looked like a beach with two to three inches of, in the old language, of of, um, lime spread all over the paddock. And then you rip that uh, in with a uh, on the back of a tractor, so that it it uh, it, it gets uh, further into the soil profile, and then uh, a season or two later, that's when you actually when the ground will have the right pH to uh, uh, to to produce the uh, to, to produce the truffle. And the way that the truffles grow is they they uh, they grow just like other um, above ground mushrooms. They're Above ground mushrooms and truffles are the are the fruit of of the fungus, and the uh, mycelium, which is uh, the fungal net, if you if you will, that's uh, people have called it the wood wide web. Um, this uh, this uh, mycelium basically, ultimately in time, grows right across the paddock from one tree to the next, and that's uh, the that's when when um, the truffles actually. Form in um, summer, so they're just a tiny. They're the size of a, of a pinhead, and with some summer rain, we need to irrigate in Australia because we don't get much summer rain. Although we got a fair bit this summer, uh, uh, they swell and they grow, uh, and uh, ultimately they fruit in very late uh, autumn and early uh, early winter. So right across southern Australia now. Uh, from uh, the higher areas in New South Wales, around Orange and uh, that, that those sorts of areas, uh, into the Snowy Mountains, right through uh, around Victoria um, and Tassie and Western Australia, which is where most of the truffles in Australia come from. About 80% of the truffles grown in Australia come from Western Australia because there are huge farms over there. Um, my, my farm's got 600 trees. The, uh, the, one of the other farms that I buy truffles from because I don't produce enough myself uh, has 40,000 trees. So there are huge farms, huge farms over there. You'd love to be a shareholder in that farm. <laughs> they're going to produce. They're going to produce about 12, 13 tons that one, on that single farm this year. I'm probably going to produce 60 kilo, kilos. That's um, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, it looks like now we're good, we've got a, a really good early season uh, because uh, we had the summer rains. We still had some warmth in summer. Uh, pretty short autumn, but now with the cold snaps that we've had right across the south, then we're really starting to get into the beginnings of the uh, of the uh, of the truffle season in Australia. Trees need truffles, and truffles need trees. What is the exact nature of this intertwined and engaged symbiotic relationship between mushroomy mycelium and thrusting roots? Basically, the the, the symbiotic relationship is one in which it's, it's, it is a genuine symbiosis where the, uh, the truffle feeds the tree and the tree feeds the truffle. 
Now, the way the tree, the, the, the way the tree feeds the truffle is that it, it provides um, sugars that the truffle can't otherwise get, and the, and uh, and the truffle um, gets moisture uh, that the tree couldn't otherwise get. What happens is the, uh, the that fungal network, the mycelium, fo- forms like uh, like a glove around the fine roots of the tree, and that's uh, that, there's an intercommunication be- uh, in that fungal net, um, and it and it is a genuine symbiotic relationship. So uh, each is dependent on the other. The host trees that we tend to use in uh, Victoria are mostly. Um, uh, oaks of one kind or another. The the, the most popular that uh, type of oak is is the holly oak or Quercus ilex is the botanical name. Uh, but people also use some hazelnuts here as host trees. Um, it, just about any any kind of oak will make a good host. So I've mostly got uh, uh, ilex, the evergreen oak, holly oak. But I do have some uh, Quercus robus, so they're the huge, great, uh, you know, great oaks from ships. Um, ships from great oaks grow. They, they are huge trees ultimately. But I do have some hazelnuts as well. Um, I must say, if I if I was planting all over again, I probably wouldn't bother with the hazelnuts. Um, not because they don't produce uh, truffles really well, uh, but because my paddock uh, has very sandy soil. So I've seen truffiers all, all, all around the world and my truffier has got the sandiest soil of any that I've ever seen anywhere from Spain to uh, North America uh, France uh, Italy so if I was growing uh, if and and, this, and and it's got and it's very quartzy soil so if I was growing uh, Riesling grapes I'd the notes that I'd be getting would be a, a sort of a flinty uh, fl- flinty Riesling so those of you who, who, who who are familiar with that uh, with that grape will will understand what I'm talking about. Then what I what I tend to get as a fl- as a sort of a, a back note in my truffle is 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 a bit of that flinty note that you would get if you were uh, growing a grape in that soil. Hogs or dogs? Nigel reckons there's a very simple answer to the question of which animal is the best partner in truffle hunting. We have to say without the without the dog there is no with there is no truffle. Now people sometimes say hogs or dogs. Uh, and there's a very simple answer to that question and it's dogs always because of the for uh, a pig and it's sows that um, uh, that the tradition that, that, that in the forest wild wild sows uh, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, what um, what um, predates the truffle? But the problem is that uh, with pigs is that they're um, they find a truffle, they're going to eat it. Uh, whereas for the dog, it's a reward game. Training a, a, a truffle dog, and any dog can do it. I've had Chihuahuas hunt at my farm. I've got a, a standard poodle, um, and also Aussie Shepherds also hunt at my uh, farm, but. There are all kinds of dogs that uh, that can be trained for truffle, and it's really just a straight scent training, just like bomb detection or customs dogs. And it's a, a train for reward uh, game, and the dogs won't eat the truffle. Um, they'll just tell you where it is. And uh, so basically what you do is you walk up and down the rows uh, of trees uh, with the dogs. Sometimes they're nearly always off lead. And they will um, pick up the scent uh, on the breeze, and a well-trained dog will actually mark, um, uh, go, go to the spot where the truffle is underneath the tree, uh, and it will mark the the um, just put its paw on 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 the on the on the top of where the truffle is. Might do a little bit of a dig. So sometimes you might see a truffle that's got a little bit of scratch in it. That's usually from the, from the dogs. Uh, uh, they, they might have just dug a little bit too deep to, to identify where that truffle is. Uh, but that's basically, um, that's basically how you find them. And then the trick is uh, you actually need to determine whether the, whether the truffle is ripe and ready to, ready to actually dig out of the ground. So, uh, so you uncover it gently uh, because you don't want to knock it. As soon as you disconnect it from the roots of the tree, that's it. it, it uh, you can't put it back in the ground. That's that. Once that connection is broken, then you must you you you've got to harvest that uh, that truffle. 
and um, and so uh, a well trained dog will will actually mark truffles that really are just ripe, rather than you know not 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 ready yet. But sometimes uh, a dog will mark, uh, and and I I'll, when I sniff it, I'll, I'll I'll say to myself, well, no, that that needs another week in the ground. So I'll leave it and I'll go and I'll mark it. I put a, a marker on the ground, um, and uh, when I come back the following week to harvest, because I harvest every week, then um, generally speaking, that truffle that I left is going to be ready uh, the following week. That's that's basically the technique. Then. Starting a truffle farm isn't like starting a farm that grows beans or cabbages. It's not as simple as sowing a seed, nurturing the plant, and watching the babies grow. With all that uncertainty and mystery, it was a very special day when Nigel found his first truffle. So the first truffle I found uh, uh, four years after planting, and I remember that that was on uh, uh, the 1st of April before 12 noon, and not being a particularly superstitious person, but aware of the of the stories about uh, the April Fool, I I really I really just took took a bit of a fright really because I, I I looked in the ground and I thought that yep that's that's a truffle all right now um, I really was just so amazed it was a lovely sunny day and I just picked up that truffle and I fell back on the ground sun on the forehead and I just just was um, <laughs> cries of joy were, were uh, passing from my lips uh, because all the hard work looked like it uh, was coming to uh, fruition so um, so I wasn't an April Fool. I've still actually got that truffle. It's a wizened up uh, old thing, um, but it sits on my desk as a reminder of that very first um, truffle that I produced. It wasn't ripe, of course, because it was before, um, well before the start of, uh, of winter, but um, that was the first of my, of my black truffles. I actually produce, grow uh, a, white tr- a, white, a white truffle as well, which the Italians call uh, the Bianchetto truffle. Uh, it's got a very, very different note. It's a, it's a very cheesy, garlicky, uh, petroleum-like sort of note. It's and unlike the black truffles, it which um, once they're out of the ground, they're not really they're not going to add to their arom- to their aroma. Um, what you see is when you pull it out of the ground is what you, is what you've got. Well, maybe within a day or two, they might uh, there might be a little bit more aroma from them. But with the uh, the Bianchetto, uh, sometimes three or four days after it's harvested, it's actually got a, p- a more powerful aroma than when it was harvested. So that's uh, quite an unusual feature of that uh, of that truffle. So uh, different pro- different uh, ri- different uh, aroma profiles and slightly different um, uh, s- slightly different uh, management techniques for for the two truffles as well, and and different cooking techniques as well, of course. The Australian truffle industry didn't exist last century. It's gone from zero to hero in an extraordinary story of commitment, trial, error and culture creation. Australia is now the third most prolific truffle growing country in the world. 22 years ago, there were no truffles in Australia uh, and uh, we have basically gone from, from nothing to being now the third largest truffle producer in the world, which is a pretty amazing um, uh, success for a, such a young uh, industry. So uh, Spain is the largest producer. Uh, uh, France is second, although sometimes that flips around depending on the, uh, on the, um, uh, the different um, uh, climatic features from year to year. Uh, uh, we're now number three, having overtaken uh, the Italy. Uh, so we've basically uh, gone from nothing to the third largest producer in a very, very short space of time. It's a, it's a pretty amazing success story, and it's in many ways it, it parallels the uh, the success of the uh, Australian wine industry, where there's uh, uh, where fine Australian wines are now really appreciated on all the tables around the around the world, all the best tables around the world. So there are probably about 500 growers in in Australia. Many of them, most of them, are small producers that might have uh, 500 or 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 a thousand or two thousand trees. But the large farms, and they are on the on the uh, on the east coast. Uh, for the most part, but the 
uh, they're, they're on the the small farms are on the east coast, really, but the big but the big farms that produce huge amounts of truffle are in Western Australia in that southwest uh, forest area, so around Manjuma Pen- Pemberton. So I go through a lot of truffles uh, each year, Danny. As I said, uh, I, I I think I'll produce. Uh, uh, perhaps 60 kilos this year, but I go through about 350, 400 kilos. And so I, I buy my truffles from the largest uh, farm in the country, which has 40,000 trees. That one farm will probably produce 13 tonnes of truffle this year. That is a hell of a lot of truffle. now, and, and nearly all of that is exported because the, the local demand just isn't there for that volume of truffle. And... and um, uh, so really, um, people often think when they think about travel, they think of oh, oh, truffle in Australia, they think about Tassie. And that's because the first truffle in Australia was produced in Tassie. But actually, uh, these days, Tasmania as a whole produces le- less than Victoria. So Tassie's probably going to produce about a half a tonne of truffle this year. Well, I think that both Victoria and New South Wales and the ACT, New South Wales and ACT together and Victoria will probably produce about two and a half to, uh, to three tonnes. But far and away, the majority of, uh, of truffle comes out of uh, those big farms in the West. Do truffles need a festival? Apparently, yes. Nigel used his marketing nous to draw a connection between truffle awareness, truffle passion and, crucially, truffle sales. The business Truffle Melbourne, uh, I found it in uh, 2014. Uh, with the first uh, truffle festival, which was uh, around this time. Um, I always do it at the start of the season um, because that just piques people's interest. And that was uh, at uh, Caulfield Racecourse in 2014. That really put things on the map. And now we are uh, the largest truffle celebration or festival outside of Europe. So... In 2019, pre, in pre-COVID days, we had 40,000 people at uh, uh, through Queen Vic Market uh, in 2019. Uh, because of the whole COVID thing, we weren't able to do a festival in, in 2020. But last year, uh, we were lucky enough to just find a break in the COVID dates. We, I think we postponed twice, but we were able to uh, 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 stage the festival at Queen Vic Market, which is uh, where, we've, where we've been for the last... Um, several years with the support of the City of Melbourne and, and Queen Vic Market. Uh, so that's one part of my business. It's, it's basically uh, running the Truffle Festival. And that's basically a, a weekend with chef demonstrations uh, about how to use truffle, not all chefy ones either, some simple uh, things to do at home. Uh, we have truffle dogs uh, showing how they hunt a truffle and then lots of... Um, uh, lots of, uh, of truffle goodies for, that are really affordable. So most of the truffle dishes that people will find uh, this year are uh, $20 or less. Uh, we've also got a truffle bar. We, we make truffle cocktails. Uh, and uh, that's basically the, the sort of festival side of things. Uh, because of that association with Queen Vic Market, I also run a pop-up uh, on, on, on uh, market days at Queen Vic Market. In fact, I've just finished at, uh, the, at, 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 at Queen Vic Market um, uh, today, and uh, that runs right through winter. So every market day right through the, the whole of the uh, Australian truffle season, which basically runs until the end of August. Uh, and then the, last, the other part of my business is, is I make truffle uh, products. So uh, I, I use the truffle from my farm uh, and I partner up with, um, uh, with specialist ingredient people uh, who work with specific ingredients. So, for example, the truffle honey, I've teamed up with Matt and Vanessa from Melbourne Rooftop Honey. They're, they're ethical honey growers, uh, honey producers, and um, so they make the truffle honey, for example. And that's... Uh, both a retail and a food service uh, uh, business, the, tr- the Truffle Melbourne, and, and also uh, it's an online business as well. So people can order uh, fresh truffle during the season and truffle product uh, produce right through the year. So we've grown the truffle, found the truffle and got the truffle home. But what do we do next? Nigel shares some of his favourite uses for this black gold. For me, simple is best. 
uh, and I think that's 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 the case for for anyone working with truffle. I, I do think that uh, some people who just shave it over the top of a dish are just really wasting their truffle uh, because I, I, you really need to cook with it. I think um, so. My absolute favourite is, is actually tr- uh, uh, truffled e- uh, truffled scrambled eggs. Really simple and easy to do. Another uh, favourite is um, I make um, I make a truffle brie. I don't actually make the brie cheese, but I buy some brie, split it down the middle. So basically, I make a brie sandwich, put truffle inside it, and then uh, wrap it up in um, in um, uh, Glad Wrap. I guess that's a brand name, but in in in, in cling wrap. And uh, put it in the fridge for a couple of days, and the truffle infuses right through the right through the brie. It's well, wonderful. I guess my other big favourite is uh, is roast chicken. Uh, and again, I make that uh, uh, a day. I prepare that a day before I'm actually going to, and sometimes two days before I'm actually going to roast. Because what I do there is I slide the uh, thinly sliced truffle under the under the skin on the breast, and I make a, uh, 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 a stuffing uh, with uh, truffle uh, added to my usual uh, stuffing mix. And then again, uh, cling wrap into the fridge for a couple of days, and the, and the truffle infuses right through the bird. And of course, you can do that with duck or uh, or squab or or or, uh, or any any. Um, bit hard to um, get the truffle under the skin with a squab but there you go um, but that those are those are my um, those are my uh, my favorite simple is best and it's the fats that carry the flavor uh, and so so dairy is is uh, any 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 dairy product is is, is going to be marvelous uh, the other the other thing I really like is um, winter vegetables um, soups so celeriac soup with truffle is is to die for um, uh, with a little bit of, I like a little bit of parsnip because I'm a big parsnip fan. So, celeriac mainly, but a little bit of parsnip and um, and truffle just just blitz through it. People think truffles are expensive, but is that a question of framing? Nigel explains how truffles can be an affordable discretionary food product. So, really, the the the, the industry has shot itself in the head by talking about three thousand dollars a kilogram. I always talk about price per gram, and and I um, because uh, really, if you're going to have a couple of friends or four four, four people around uh, for dinner, so six of you all together, uh, at at five to eight grams per person per dish, you're going to spend uh, about the same as you would on a couple of bottles of wine, good wine that you're going to put on the table. So, look, it's not it's not an everyday thing, but it is. Uh, I like to say it's an affordable luxury, and it only comes around uh, for. Uh, three months of the year, so um, you know. I, I uh, uh, at Truffle Melbourne, we I, I sell uh, f- fresh truffles for two dollars, fi- whole truffles for two dollars fifty a gram, and what I call a home chef's grade, which are, which is basically trim truffle. It's exactly the same truffle. It's just in small pieces, and that's two dollars a gram. So, if you're preparing a if you're preparing a soup or a risotto or something like that, or stuffing for a bird. You don't need uh, uh, the fancy-looking uh, truffle. Uh, you, do, you just uh, uh, you just uh, can use the uh, the less expensive version. So truffles in Australia, generally speaking, are going to be two two dollars fifty to three dollars. Sometimes some growers will charge three dollars fifty, and I've, I have seen them for four dollars a gram. Um, I think that's way too expensive myself. Um, but that's the sort of price range that we're talking um, around that two dollars. 50 to three dollars 50 a gram nigel lives and breeds truffles all year round what does he love most about what he does i love truffles because of the because of that aroma profile the, the thing that i look forward to every year is opening the fridge door uh when i've got some truffle in 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 the fridge because the the aroma just wafts out of the out of the, out of the fridge um and uh that's an aroma that I just I'd kill for. So, fresh truffle is um, is something that I just um, I just really appreciate, um, and uh, I, I guess I like it because I think what I've been able to do is to popularise the truffle in ways um, uh, that um, 
uh, that really showcase the uh, the utility and the versatility of the ingredient. It's a flavor enhancer. And um, when I first was thinking about uh, should I or shouldn't I uh, do a truffle festival, I actually commissioned some research from because I got a bit of a marketing background, and so I, I, I commissioned Roy Morgan to do some market research. One of the things that was really particularly interesting about that work was that uh, they found that awareness of truffle was the highest in Perth and in Canberra. And there's a very simple reason for that, and that is that at the time there was a, uh, a truffle festival being run in Perth and another one in Canberra. The one in Canberra is still going. Um, uh, the one in Perth has fallen over um, for reasons that I won't bore, bore listeners with, but um, that you, that was at Mundaring just out of, out of, um, out of Perth. There is now a different uh, festival in Western Australia called the Truffle Kerfuffle, and that's actually located in the growing areas in uh, in Western Australia, in Manjimup, in the, in the southwest of uh, Western Australia, in, in um, uh, about three and a half hours south of Perth, uh, and that's a weekend festival. And likewise, the uh, and um, uh, and I think it's I'm not sure about the dates for uh, for this uh, for this year, but people can can just Google truffle kerfuffle, uh, and um, the Canberra festival doesn't have a, a single large gathering, but basically has a lot of little uh, events. So events at a market or events at a, at a truffle farm in, uh, in Canberra or just out of Canberra in, um, in southern New South Wales there. So that was really what convinced me to, to do the festival because the awareness of, um, of truffle and the correlation between the awareness of truffle and truffle festivals was really what um, tickled my fancy. And, um, and I think uh, with 40,000 people rocking up in 2019, um, you know, I, I think I've really put truffles on the map here in, um, here in Victoria and, and in many ways in, um, uh, we have people, vis- visitors from international visitors coming to the festival, people coming out of, which now of course they can again, uh, people coming out of Singapore and uh, and New Zealand in particular, uh, uh, and lots of uh, interstate visitors as well as people from rural uh, Victoria, r- rural and regional Victoria. And the Australian the truffle industry is an incredible success story. Two decades ago, it was merely a dream. Now it's the third biggest truffle industry in the world, with chefs across the globe looking forward to truffles from down under. Nigel Wood has been a huge part of the story, growing truffles, sharing expertise, and fostering the excitement that greets the season every time winter rolls around. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Danny Vallant. Stay tuned as we talk to some of Australia's best farmers, makers, and growers. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or contact us via deepintheweeds.com.au.